Good morning. I, uh, I hope this is a, a blessed Easter week for all of you. I hope um, Jesus draws you near to him during this week. Uh, I just have a quick announcement before Dr. Kapik introduces our very special guest for this morning. Uh, we are in the process of uh, taking applications for worship leaders, uh, music worship leaders for chapel for next year. Um, Leah is going to send out um, an email campus-wide, and if you're interested, uh, there's a link to the application inside. So please uh, be looking out for that email. And now, Dr. Kevin. It is my uh, great privilege this morning to introduce a dear friend to you, Ms. Gerilyn Sanders. Gerilyn is a very impressive person in many respects. She received a BA in psychology from Biola University. We can forgive her for that. <laughs> the Biola part, not the psych part. Uh, no, it's a great sister institution in California. And her master's of education, she got it from this small school you might have heard called Harvard. <laughs> and since receiving her degrees, she's been involved in a variety of educational and youth development programs in the US with emphasis on urban communities. We're thankful that now, and some of you may know her because of this, she is now part of the team at the Chalmers Center. Here, many of her skills and passions have come together, serving to help encourage God's people to come alongside the often disenfranchised folks, helping to, uh, helping to cultivate situations and skills where people can grow in grace and truth and community. With all of that out of the way, I also just want to extend a personal warm welcome to Gerilyn because we're so thankful she's with us. She and Duane, her dear husband, are dear friends of Tabitha and mine and have been for years, and together with their children, Bryce and Dakota, we've walked through a fair number of ups and downs in life together, even amid the chaos. And I will tell you, and afterwards, if you're feeling a little down, you'll have to look for these guys. When life is difficult, all you need is for Bryce to smile and he will light up a room. And now he's smiled and embarrassed, I love it. Or get Dakota to come and give you a hug and the world feels better. With these things, they all point back to a remarkable and faithful family. And it is with great joy I bring to you Gerilyn Sanders. Thank you all for clapping long enough for me to walk up the stairs and, and get here. I appreciate that. Um, it is a real honor and a privilege to be here this morning. Um, as, as Kelly said, as many dear friends of mine here uh, at Covenant and of our families. And so um, I don't often get to speak to groups of students, though, so this is a rare treat. Thank you for allowing me to do that. Um, my role at Chalmers is also a great joy and a privilege. I get to kind of get a front row seat for all that God is doing in his church and through his people, um, particularly as it... Uh, relates to addressing poverty in our world. Um, and so I'm constantly being reminded as an educator of the power of story and how God uses stories to um, teach us things. And so this morning, I just want to tell you a story. Um, so if you will bear with me, allow me to tell you this story um, that God has been using in my life over the last few years to teach me some things. Um, I'll warn you, it's not necessarily told in chronological order but it is the order in which God is revealing it to me, so I hope it can be of some encouragement to you as well. Um, so my pastor in college used to say, so stick with me because I'm going somewhere. All right, so I don't know about you, but has anyone ever had one of those how did I get here moments? Like we just kind of look around and say, what, how did this happen? So if I had a title for this talk, it would be how did I get here? Um, so this experience happened to me one day I just kind of woke up and found myself sitting in a row of seats kind of like this wearing a cap and gown in Harvard Yard and I thought wait what 
how, how did this happen? I'm, perhaps you would not be surprised to find yourself at Harvard Yard. Perhaps it's part of your 10-year plan. Perhaps you have a family that has money saved up for you to go to advanced degrees, or maybe you were from uh, a family in New England where Harvard is normal. Um, but I grew up in Sweetwater, Tennessee. And uh, my high school didn't even have like AP or college prep courses. And my dad was a bivocational pastor who worked in a factory. So Harvard was not anywhere on my radar screen. And, and I would have just said, I'm not really even the Ivy League type, had no interest. Um, and yet here I was, <laughs> about to receive a master's degree from this institution, and I thought back over the last year, um, and I thought how God had just taken me from where I was in my urban community in Washington, D.C., working with kids and families, and just started to move things and people and open doors, and I found myself in a place that I had not expected to be. And so I sat there on Harvard Yard, and I kind of was looking around, looking at the trees, um, and Harvard is an old institution, the oldest educational institution in America, founded in 1636. And so while I was looking at the trees, I was thinking about 1636. Would these trees have even been here in 1636? Maybe they were saplings. And for some reason, God put it on my mind. I started thinking about, my fam where would my family have been in 1636? I thought about 1736. Well, by then, at least some of my Ancestors may have started to make their way over from Africa. The Middle Passage was, uh, the, the transatlantic slave trade was probably in full, full swing in 16, 1736. I thought about 1836. And by then, we, we do have some records of um, some sides of my family, um, clearly in America by 1836. I thought about 1936, my grandparents living, um, at least half of them in, in the Jim Crow South. And I just thought, who? Which of them would have ever thought that one of us would be at Harvard? <laughs> Impossible. Um, and so I started to think in that moment, as I was just kind of having this minute with God, of my grandmother, Mildred. My grandma, Mildred, uh, was a smart woman. She's on top of her class um, in the late 30s. Um, would have really liked to have gone to nursing school uh, to become a nurse. But at that time in, in Tennessee, the options were very limited. She would have had to travel far away to get a degree, her family had no money, um, and so she was not able to go to college. Loved education, loved to learn, um, but she married my grandfather and was a farmer's wife. Had eight kids, and professionally, she was the help. She worked for wealthy white families in town, and she was, did the cooking and the cleaning and the taking care of the kids. Um, had a phenomenal green thumb, could grow anything. Um, a phenomenal cook, um, everybody would you know line up to get her her food at the church dinners. Um, and so I thought about her, and you know, my dad tells the stories of her, her getting up at four o'clock in the morning, going outside to catch a chicken, kill the chicken, pluck the chicken, fry the chicken for breakfast for her eight kids, and then go to work to take care of somebody else's kids. Um, and I thought about just how excited she must be that, that I was having this opportunity. And that's when it hit me. This was not about me. It was not because of me, and it wasn't for me. This opportunity that God had given me was because he was doing something in, through me, in my family, and because of women and men like my grandparents who did not have opportunities, I was just the representative. I, I was just at a place where I was the recipient of sowing that had happened years and years before me. And so, there was this realization in that moment that God's story, we may not even know what it is. We may not even know what our part of it is or where we're going to end up, but God is doing something with his story, and he will move us where he needs us to be. And sometimes your part of the story is to reap what other people have sown. And so as I thought about my grandmother, um, when, I, when I walked across that stage, I told myself, this degree is for my grandmother. This is my grandmother's degree. And everything that I do with this is my responsibility, not just to make myself richer, um, but it really is to be used as part of the ongoing story. So I got to tell you, and, and for you who are students thinking about your futures and, and you know, got to have the plan all together, I've got to know exactly what's going to happen. Some of you are you know, planners, and that's good, you should be, do your best, but 
I'm telling you, it's not your story. You're not writing it. I can unapologetically tell people I've got a degree from Harvard. It's not my story, not my glory. I was, I'm just doing what the next thing I know for God is, is that God is revealing to me, and God will use it as he, he sees fit. So I had this moment, I'm blown away with God's goodness, thinking about my family, thinking about the sense of responsibility that I now have um, because of what's been afforded me. Um, and that really, really impacted me for, for several years, but I really didn't even know the half of it. Um, and by the way, I did write a tribute to my grandmother on her 80th birthday where I, I told her this moment that I had. I had the privilege of telling her that the degree was her degree. Um, but just a couple years ago, my niece uh, in the fourth grade got this assignment in school where her, bless her heart, very well-meaning teacher, um, they were studying Ellis Island and immigration. And so the teacher gave them the assignment to find out who the first person in your family was that came to America looking for new opportunities and coming to America for a better life. And my sweet little niece raises her hand and says, well, not all of our families came here because we wanted to <laughs> or because life would be better. And so, <laughs> and so the teacher wisely says, okay, well, see if you can find out who the first person in your family is um, that came to America. And I don't know if any of you are history buffs, if you like this kinds of things, but it's really difficult to find records. It's very rare um, for African-American families to be able to trace their lineage back very far um, because for long periods of time, you're dependent strictly on census records um, and bills of sale, things like that. But my mom went on this journey and found um, a, a whole new set of the cloud of witnesses that I didn't know about. We went back um, and found the record of a little girl who remembered being a youngster playing in her village in Africa when the village was overrun and she was captured, packed onto a ship like cattle, laying shoulder to shoulder with other human beings, no sanitation for weeks on the ocean. Somehow this little girl survives this trauma and arrives on American soil to Charleston, South Carolina. Sometime around the early 1800s, around 1820 maybe. We don't know anything about her early childhood. We don't know anything about what happened to her or how she processed that experience. But we do know that around the start of the Civil War, around 1860, um, the young woman has been named Sylvia, and Sylvia has a family, has three children of her own, William, Samuel, and a daughter named Daphne. Um, so I've, this is, I'm, I'm a history nerd, right? So I've, I've just in the last few weeks, handwritten narratives uh, from my family that I didn't know we had of this story. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of exciting parts to it to me. Um, but what we find out is that um, Sylvia, and her daughter Daphne are domestic servants. So they work in the house, they do the cooking, the cleaning, the caring for the babies. Um, but we also know that Sylvia is a praying woman, a woman who believes in the power of prayer. Um, and so while Sylvia's family is in Charleston, South Carolina, at the beginning of the Civil War, um, landowners are starting to get a little concerned, war is about to happen, and so the family in Charleston sells um, Sylvia's family to a less affluent family in Georgia. So they migrate together down to Georgia. Um, so in addition to her skills as um, a domestic servant, Daphne also is gifted with medicine. She's a nursemaid. She's really good um, at caring for people who are sick and nursing them back to health. She's good with plants and herbs. Um, so she's really began to study that even as a young girl. Um, and then she also secretly has been taught to read. Now, I say this secretly because, as you may or may not know, it was against the law to teach a slave to read in those days. So her mother tells her, don't tell anybody that you know how to read. Um, but this is something that um, is important and exciting to the family. Well, as they're not in Georgia very long when um, this family also begins to experience troubles during the war, and they have to sell the family, and they're gonna split, they split them up. They sell them into East Tennessee and divide up the family. And Daphne and Sylvia are devastated. They are uh, horrified about being separated. Um, they are uh, pleading for this not to happen, but it happens anyway. And so Daphne, Sylvia tells Daphne to, to be a good girl, to say her prayers, to remember who she is. Now, this is just a sidebar thing, let me say. 
To me, the most incredible evidence that there is that God is real, that the God of the Bible is really who he says he is, is the fact that in the 1800s, you find Africans enslaved who have a strong faith in God. The fact that they can see past the terrible sales job the Europeans have done for Christianity. The fa they've been sold this message that there is a God, he has created a master race and an under race, and your job is to be, he expects your obedience, and if you're really good, one day you get to go to this segregated part of heaven. That's what they're sold. And somehow, God cuts through that and reveals himself as Abba Father to these people who have this hope, who says, you know what, God is with me. God sees me in my suffering. And Daphne and Sylvia pray and pour out their prayers to God with their brokenheartedness, and God is there. So the family split up into East Tennessee. Um, Daphne is around between 10 and 12. Um, she prays every night to see her mother. She falls into a, a, a slight depression. She's not happy there. She's treated very harshly, actually, in this situation. Uh, this family um, is really barely just scraping by by now in the war. So they barely have food to feed themselves, much less her. Um, and so at the conclusion of the Civil War, Daphne is in this home with strangers in a place she doesn't know. Technically, she's emancipated, but she has nowhere to go and she has no one. Um, and so what does she do? She prays and she, she just, she's there living for free, basically. Well, unbeknownst to her, somewhere else in East Tennessee, Sylvia, <laughs> at the conclusion of the war, has managed to pool her resources and find this broken down, sorry, pitiful excuse for a mule and is riding around to farms and communities all over East Tennessee asking people if they've seen her children. This is in the era of, you know, there's no missing children's network. There's no um, Amber Alert. There's no pictures on the backs of milk cartons. There's this woman on this pitiful mule driving around to little churches asking if anybody's seen a description of her children. Um, and as Daphne describes it to her grandchildren later, she says, if I live to be 100, I'll never forget the day I saw my mama riding over the horizon on that mule to come and get me. And not only does Sylvia collect Daphne, but Sylvia successfully gets William and Samuel as well. And when you think about that, what are the odds? If you've studied your history, you know that at the end of the Civil War, there were millions of displaced Africans. There was a Freedmen's Bureau founded in Washington, D.C. to try to help families reconnect. Most of them never did. Hundreds of thousands of mothers out there prayed to see their children again, and they never did. Why did God answer Sylvia's prayer? What was it about her persistence in prayer and faith that God rewarded? When I think about that, I think about the fact that God's story is massive. It, it expands through eons of time and decades, hundreds of years even, his scope. But it's also minuscule. That God hears the cries and prayers of this one nobody slave woman who has lost her family once before, and somehow God chooses to restore this family and to answer her prayers and get them back together. You know, it makes me think of the scripture where David says, when I consider all the heavens, who, who are people that you care about us? Why, why would God care about that? But maybe because Sylvia, to borrow from scripture, believed God with the little bit of knowledge that she had, it was credited to her as righteousness. And maybe God allowed, not maybe, clearly, God chose to answer her prayers in a way because it was part of a larger story that he's telling. Now, that's me. That's where I am. I don't know your story. I don't know where you are. If you're in this room, clearly someone has sown something that you are, have the ability to reap. Clearly, um, that is the case. But maybe you've never stopped to really think about that. Maybe you've not stopped to consider what is the big picture? You know, here in America, we're so individualistic. We're so, uh, we have such a tendency to think about, you know, me and where I'm going and my plan and my family. But just, I would encourage you, sometime this week, maybe as you're thinking through Easter, and as we see ourselves reflected in the story of Christ and what he did for us and our death and resurrection with him, Think about the fact that it's not just those stories in the Bible didn't just happen to those people way back then. 
God was doing things somewhere in people that were connected to your line somewhere. If not direct relatives, somebody has impacted you. And for that, we can be profoundly grateful. But then the, biggest, the bigger question for me that God just keeps hammering to me over and over and over again is what are the characteristics and the traits that you're displaying in your life that are going to be around 200 years from now? There are things that I can see in my family and in myself that didn't originate with me, started way back with Sylvia, who passed down to Daphne, who passed it on to her son John, who passed it to his son Jim, who passed it on to my grandma Mildred, who passed it on to my father, who passed it to me. And so maybe your family line doesn't have that extension, but maybe you're the first one. And you're, there is something that God has entrusted you or some opportunity that you have somewhere that is your opportunity to leave that lasting impact to whoever the circle is that God brings to you. So I want you to just maybe take a minute. Yeah, I know you don't have, you're not allowed to have cell phones, but you can jot, jot this down or make yourself a note. At some point, this is a, your, your assignment to go away with. Sometime in the next week, think about that. What, what is it that I want my life to demonstrate or display in a way that can, that will still be around in a positive way, making an impact. You don't always get to choose how it's gonna happen, but in terms of a persistent faith, man, I can't tell you the sense of responsibility I feel not to be the one to drop the ball <laughs> in my family. Um, and so as you think about just God, what do you wanna do? It's not my story, it's your story. What, what am I to do with these opportunities you've given me? I want to encourage you to enter in that story with me, um, and let's just um, see what God will do. I, I happen to know I'm surprised every week at something he's doing I didn't see coming. So let me, let me just pray for us. Close this with a word of prayer. God of the universe, we are so grateful. We thank you that you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you are also the God of Sylvia and Daphne and Mildred. That you have an eternal scope and plan. That you have our lives already mapped out for us. Because it's part of your story, Lord. We're not the star. Your son Jesus is the star. We get to have our moments on stage, Lord. As we look around the world, if, if we just relied on the news, Lord, we would think that everything is in chaos and the bad guys are winning. Lord, we know that there are Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, who are mistreated and downtrodden, uh, persecuted. Lord Jesus, won't you give them just ridiculous, senseless, faith, and joy, perseverance under trial. And Lord, here we are, relatively safe, relatively prosperous, full of opportunities, Lord. Remind us it's not for us, it's not about us. So we ask you to use us, use everything we've got, Allow us to surrender ourselves to your plan and to your story. Lord, I thank you for these students and for what you will do with them in each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah.